Welcome to Lesson 4, Context for Instruction. Today we're just going to do an overview of a lot of the things that really help children with autism spectrum disorders function in the classroom. And then we're going to end with uh, a little bit about concrete calendar schedules. Let's start with the physical environment. You know, the physical environment really provides the basic foundation for the learning space. And because children with autism have disorganized nervous systems, it's really, really important that their physical environment or their learning space be organized and delineated for them. Because if you have a chaotic nervous system and then you put a chaotic physical space together, guess what you get? Yep, chaos. And I've seen this time and time again, these really brilliant teachers with such disorganized spaces that it really takes so much more talent and effort just to focus the children's um, attention. So spaces should generally be defined to show the expectations of that area because remember that functional connectivity, the children with autism may not automatically infer what's supposed to go on. So if the space gives them a hint, that's one more support for them. So storage areas should always be defined. Is this the place for coats? Is this the place for lunch boxes? Is this the place for homework? Is this the place for books? Always define those areas, either by labeling if they're liter literate or real photographs if they're not, or even line drawings if you want to. Be aware of distractors, and I don't mean you can't have a pretty room. You absolutely can have a pretty room. But if you have a place that provides information, such as homework or things on the whiteboard, try and make those things clean and bold and stand out. Use visual boundaries for dividing space. Big spaces are disorganizing for children with autism. So if you can use low bookcases def to define space. Um, a long time ago we used to use tape, duct tape, but I don't think they'll let you do that because there is a, a tripping hazard now. But anything you can that really helps define the space. Even a blanket on the floor for the reading area. Something like that that really helps you. For middle school and high school areas, you know, you can use your desks to help you define. You can use bookcases to help you define. I do suggest, however, that you not put real high bookcases because that limits your um, ability to see what's going on. So I like those low bookcases where, you know, it still provides a nice dividing, but you can still see. Okay. So... We also know that a nice prompt without having to use voice or anything else is proximity. So you want to make sure that you're able to get in close proximity to all the children in your classroom. And I say this because sometimes you have those narrow classrooms where all the desks are lined up and in the very back and it's very difficult for someone to to naturally kind of walk through that so if you have one of those long narrow classrooms you might want to think about turning it so um, it's wide and and you're up in front of the narrower narrower side excuse me also think about a stimulus shelter you know, we'll talk a little more about this later, but many children with autism have um, sensory issues and get really overloaded with noise or visual stimulation, even tactile stimulation quite easily. And it's really a, a really nice benefit if a classroom has a little place that they can go to where they can calm and, and just um, be in kind of a quieter place. You know, it may be a listening station, it may be a reading place or some place where, you know, they can relax. Um, preschool classrooms sometimes have those little tents. Um, things like that that really um, know, the child can know, well, you know, if I get overloaded, I can go calm myself down and then be ready to learn later. Um, we talked a little bit about teacher sight lines and ability to mingle. 
um, also about student sight lines so they can see you and they can see what your the visuals that you're talking about because visuals are so important so if you're holding up a piece of paper and saying everybody should be on this page make sure everyone can see that piece of paper also use personal touches I think personal touches make children with autism um, connect things with the teacher make um, help them to learn what to talk about with them make them feel more at home so you wouldn't think that makes a difference but it really really does so we also want to think about the temporal structure of our teaching so first we need to think about how our time is used we know that all people, us included, do best with predictable routines. Children with autism for sure need predictable routines. Those of us that have ever gone on a field trip or had a day that was just totally unstructured really know how hard that is for them and for us. Um, and, you know, as we talked before, it's a kind of a fine line between a predictable structure and a really, really static structure that doesn't allow children to learn flexibility. But the framework needs to stay. And if it's being deviated from, we need to support those deviations. In other words, it's not right for children with autism to just be expected, well, they've just got to get used to it. Um, that's actually scaring them and increasing their anxiety. But if we can do a little bit to support deviations, do a little bit to support more mental flexibility, then they learn to be able to go with the flow a lot easier. And we'll talk of many ways to do that. But like many, uh, most of the evidence-based practices in this area, they're visual, visual schedules, things like that, that help support deviations. So, um, you know, when, when you do have changes, really be aware that that's a troubled time for your child with autism spectrum disorder. Activity length. So when we're talking about how long an activity should be, of course we have to consider their age and their abilities. You know, how, how are their cognitive abilities compared to what we're asking them to do? And certainly, um, there are lots of individual characteristics coming at us with um, children with autism. So sometimes you have two children of kind of equal abilities and one needs something new all the time and the other one is a little, uh, a little more laid back and can go at um, a longer pace. Um, lastly, we have to think about the context. You know, are we expecting them to listen in a group versus listening individually? Are we expected to, expecting them to listen with noise? Are we expecting them to listen with lots of visual supports or is it mostly auditory? All those things influence our activity length. And I don't think that's any different than any child. So when we try and think about how to set up our whole day, or when we try and think of how to just set up a particular lesson, we have to think about the sequence of activities. Um, certainly, I prefer to start with a preferred activity and then go with, to a non-preferred activity because I think if you get a child on a roll being compliant and enjoy himself, he's more likely or she's more likely to continue that. And I think that goes against what most of us think about. We think, oh, let's get the hard stuff out of the way first. And I think that is a consideration. Certainly early on in the day, you may have more energy, but I think you have to build momentum before you get to the hard stuff. Next, we have to think of seated versus non-seated. What kind of levels of energy are needed for what we're doing? and what kind of movement is needed for sustained attention. We know that, that adults should only stay seated for about 20 minutes at a time. And I know we don't always um, take that to heart as college professors, but um, I think that's what the research tells us. So when we're thinking about children doing something, we shouldn't expect them to sit for longer than 20 minutes at a time without a change, a movement, something. And we also have to remember that children with autism have 
um, a, a pretty poor sense of where their body is in space and they lose it after they've been sitting in one place for longer and longer periods of time as we'll talk about um, in future lessons. So just in the same way if you've been sitting in a day-long lecture you kind of start to fidget around and and kind of hit your body a little bit by jumping up and down in the seat and scooching around to try and figure out where you are in space again because you you lose your cognitive sense of where your body is. Next we have to think about complexity. How complex is what we're asking them to do? This is pretty common sense. You know that, you know, I know, for instance, for me, when I'm writing a paper, I can't write for, you know, hours upon hours upon hours. It's very hard for me to do that, so I have to do it in little spurts of time because it's so complex and intense for me. So other things, however, if I'm, you know, playing with kids or um, even teaching, I can go for much longer periods of time and not feel, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. Um, we also have to think of skill levels, and that kind of goes with complexity. How complex is the skill um, that we're asking them to do? What is their skill level as compared to what we're doing? And behavioral momentum, and, and I kind of talked about that with preferred versus non-preferred activities. Um, but I think behavioral momentum is so very important. It's so uh, makes so much difference in the day if you start off the day very positive and very energetic and very um, children are being very successful. I think that's just key to setting the tone for your day.